So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the CPRI Bradford series of talks. I'm Tim Searchinger. I'm a senior research scholar in CPRI. And uh, it's my delight to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, who is uh, Dr. Gunter Subarau, coming to us from, from Jirkas. It's a, in addition to being um, a great honor to have him speaking, it's a particular a delight or a particular debt because it is one in the morning in Japan where he is speaking from. Uh, I got to, uh, became familiar with Dr. Subarau's work uh, many years ago when I was in the process of spending eight years writing a really long report for the WRI, the World Bank, and the UN on how to feed the world while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the biggest challenges is dealing with nitrogen pollution because nitrogen is critical for agriculture uh, and yet it causes all kinds of pollution problems, including nitrous oxide, which is a major greenhouse gas. And then I became familiar in the early stages with some work on something called biological nitrification inhibition uh, from Colombia. And I'll let Dr. Subarau explain what that is. But I realized even from the earliest days of, of limited research, that this was an important possible way of dealing with this gigantic challenge of nitrogen pollution. And the originator of that whole line of research uh, was Dr. Subarau, leading to a number of papers, uh, PNAS and otherwise. And then I was lucky enough to be invited to attend a, a uh, conference uh, of people doing this research and realized that Dr. Subra had almost kind of single-handedly managed to interest a broad sector of, of crop breeders in developing this, even though the budgets were tiny. Uh, and I was, uh, part of my job in life is kind of to market good ideas for dealing with climate change. So I, I was uh, lucky enough to co-author a paper kind of basically setting forth all the reasons why this was an important line of work and how it could help deal with a number of challenges. Uh, and in the course of that doing, which came out last year in Penn ES, uh, another really landmark paper came, a real research paper from Dr. Subarau about wheat and BNI. So this is a category of the critical type of technological innovations we're gonna need if we're gonna actually solve climate change and the relationship of agriculture and, and, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. So I'll just say that Dr. Subarau is a senior research scientist at GIRCOS, which is the foreign, uh, uh, the overseas um, research agency funded by Japan. He has more than hundred peer reviewed articles. His PhD is from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, he's, he's spent two and a half years in the United States at NASA at the Kennedy Space Center. He's gonna give a TED talk we're incredibly lucky uh, to be on the ground here now with this important research. So turning it over to you, Dr. Subra. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and, and thanks for that wonderful introduction uh, for, for me and, and also for, for our work. And uh, good, af good afternoon to uh, all, all the friends and colleagues from uh, Princeton. It's my pleasure uh, to share some of our work uh, with uh, such a distinguished uh, uh, group of audience. So as uh, uh, Tim has introduced my talk, um, so low nitrifying agricultural systems, uh, um, why they are going to be critical for the next green revolution. Uh, that's, that's going to be the topic of my presentation. And the, and the role of uh, biological nitrification inhibition, inhibition in uh, attaining the low nitrifying production systems. Okay. Um, so most of you know that uh, the nitrogen fertilizer uh, was invented, uh, the industrial uh, production of nitrogen fertilizer was invented sometime in early 90s. 
uh, until uh, 1950s and 60s, uh, its use in agriculture was not known. So its use in agriculture started only in the early 50s. And the, 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 the use uh, really intensified in agriculture, uh, industrially fixed nitrogen fertilizer only started around the 60s and the 70s. It picked up um, that coincided with the, the breeding for uh, the high yield, uh, that's when they introduced uh, the, the semi-dwarf uh, genes into the, the wheat materials. And that is mated with the, the nitrogen fertilizer applications. That is the beginning of green revolution. And, and before that, uh, there was no nitrogen fertilizer applied in agriculture. Uh, it's only started in, uh, in the early 60s and uh, 70s. So in the early part of green revolution, that uh, the, the, the world was using only around five to six, uh, five to uh, around five million metric tons. Uh, nitrogen fertilizer globally. And then now which has grown into 150 million metric tons currently we are using. And uh, nearly a 30 fold increase in nitrogen fertilizer application in agriculture in a span of uh, five decades. Uh, when we started using nitrogen fertilizer, <clears throat> Of course, there is a lot of euphoria, and uh, you know the 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 the, the entire uh, food production has it, it has transformed. The the and uh, the the food the the global um, food grain production has quadrupled in the last five decades because of the green revolution, and provided the uh, uh, global food security. Uh, but uh, in the process. Uh, um, the nitrogen fertilizer consumption has grown into nearly 30 fold. For a four fold increase in global food, food, food production, the nitrogen fertilizer consumption has grown 30 fold. And this is what this is the reason, this is what, what you see. The nitrogen use efficiency is constantly coming down. Um, during this period. And now the nitrogen use efficiency is so low in most production systems. It, it ranges from only 30 to 50%. The worst case can be up to 25%, 20 to 25% in certain parts of the world where there is a lot of uh, intensification going on. Um, so the nitrogen fertilizer is very, very expensive uh, in terms of energy. It costs about uh, two liter diesel oil equivalent for, to produce one ki kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer. So it is estimated that nearly 1.7 billion barrels of diesel oil equivalent energy we are spending in order to produce this 150 million metric tons. And nearly 70% of this nitrogen fertilizer is leaking out of the system and creating a lot of uh, nitrogen pollution problems, which I will be showing a little bit later. The direct economic loss from the last nitrogen fertilizer is about uh, 90, billion, uh, 90 billion annually. But the, 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 uh, the other uh, ecological and the, the health costs uh, are, are, are much, much, much higher than the, the direct fertilizer. Uh, cost uh, and also the 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 nitrogen pollution the is another um, is uh, the, uh, the the nitrogen fertilizer application is also causing the emission of nitrous oxide from the agricultural fields and uh, you can see the nitrous oxide levels are uh, have started going up in the early 60s, the beginning of green revolution and the beginning of industrial in the uh, in beginning of application of industrially produced nitrogen fertilizer in agricultural systems, and it's now going in a linear fashion. And uh, the uh, the antiwar concentration in the atmosphere has increased almost 30 percent during this period, the last five decades. Look at the farm soil. And uh, it's a farm soil is a, a living biological system, and there is an invisible uh, microbial ecosystem that exists in, in our farm soils. And uh, 
it's so vast and so complex. It's much more complex than the entire ecosystem, what you see above the ground. Just to give you an example, a gram of soil contains more than 10 billion microbes in a gram of soil. That is more than the entire human population on Earth. So you can imagine the kind of a complex biological system that, that is, exists in our farmlands. So in this, in, in this microbial population, a, a section of the microbial population is involved in uh, nitrification process. That means uh, oxidation of ammonium into nitrate. Most of, uh, most of the uh, nitrogen fertilizers, what we apply, is in ammonium form. So in the natural system, there's not so much infusion of ammonium nitrogen fertilizer seeds. Whatever, uh, whatever is available is slowly, it, 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 is, it, it is coming from the natural forces or some of the organic matter mineralization. It, it comes in a much more slower manner. But when we started applying uh, the nitrogen fertilizer in a massive scale, particularly in the last five decades, it has altered the microbial population behavior. It has favored certain microbial population in such a way that uh, the nitrifying populations, not nitrifying bacteria, got super activated because of the nitrogen applications from the last five decades. So it has become so activated that uh, all the fertilizer nitrogen, what we are applying is so rapidly converted into nitrate in a very short period of time. And that is one of the reasons why we have all these nitrogen problems, uh, that the nitrogen is leaking out from the system and uh, and contaminating the larger ecosystem and most of the problems what you see associated with nitrogen fertilizer, fertilizers is because of this uncontrolled night fire activity of these farm sites. And normally <clears throat> uh, the ammonium is the major form of uh, uh, nitrogen source for the plants uh, for converting, for taking it up and converting into plant protein. But uh, what happened in the last five decades is uh, the night fire activity is so dominant, it has dominated uh, in, the, in the entire farmland, uh, the, uh, the, the night, fire, night, night firing system, that uh, more than 95% of the nitrogen that is available for the crop uptake is in the form of nitrate because all the nitrogen that is coming into the system through the fertilizer application is so rapidly converted into nitrate. It only takes a few days, uh, hardly a week, all the fertilizer nitrogen gets converted into nitrate. And once it is converted into nitrate, it's very, very difficult to keep the nitrogen in the, in the farmland. That's the reason it washes out because it cannot bind to the soil. It washes out from the, the, from, the, uh, from the farmlands and enters into the aquatic system. So the water uh, into the uh, lakes and leaches into the underground and, and, and the groundwater and contaminates the, uh, the groundwater and make it un, uh, unfit for the human consumption. Um, so this is one of the problems. So the night fire activity become uncontrollable now. And that is where we think that uh, going, in, going towards the low night firing systems where the nitrate production is highly regulated in the, in, in the farmlands is the key to uh, improve the nitrogen use efficiency and also improve the soil fertility and reduce the uh, nitrogen pollution. And this is very critical for the next green revolution because we need to protect the soil fertility and also we need to use judiciously the nitrogen fertilizers in the future. And uh, I'm going to come to that point a little bit later. And this is what happens when the nitrogen is leaks out into the into the water bodies. And this is one of the largest uh, freshwater lakes in China, uh, contaminated with the uh, Nit nitrate and triggered the uh, algal blooms. And it, you, you can imagine how long it is going to take to, to clean up these rivers, uh, to clean up these um, the lakes. Uh, 
And also, this is the, the nitrate pollution in groundwater in different parts of the world. It's, not, it's, it's, it's already reaching the threshold levels. Um, and they, they, most of the places in Indo-Gangetic plains, the groundwater is contaminated with nitrates to such a level that it is almost impossible to use it for drinking purpose. To, uh, to again process this groundwater and remove the nitrate is a very expensive process. So it's very important uh, uh, to control the uh, nitrate formation in farmlands uh, in future. Uh, otherwise, we can't sustain uh, the, 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 the fertility of our soils. We can't uh, continue uh, allow the nitrogen to be leaked out from our farm, farmlands and contaminate the larger ecosystem like the way it has been going on now. So by 2050, the, the world population is going to reach about 10 billion from the current 8 billion at present. And in order to feed uh, the, the, the expected uh, increase in the population, we probably need around 70 to 80 percent more food grain production. Then, but in order to do that, it is expected that we may have to, the, the projected nitrogen fertilizer usage would reach close to 300 million metric tons by 2050. So which means we need to double the nitrogen fertilizer application if we, if we use the current nitrogen management system, if we use the current agricultural technology. Then imagine um, now itself uh, uh, a lot of nitrogen pollution you see in many parts of the world, whether it is freshwater lakes or in groundwater. If we if we if we double the nitrogen fertilizer uh, consumption, you could imagine what you see here in some parts of the world is going to be everywhere by 2050, and also the nitrous oxide levels are going to be doubled from the present levels too, if we continuously increase the nitrogen fertilizer use the way we are using it now. So the challenge is how to double the food production by 2050 without substantially increasing the nitrogen fertilizer consumption from present levels. So as I said, that. The, the nitrogen is available in two forms, ammonium and nitrate in, in our farmlands. In natural systems, you don't have much nitrate. Most of the nitrogen is in the ammonium form. But when it comes to the farmlands, because we have changed the microbial activity so much lately, most of the nitrogen is available in nitrate form. And that is the reason it has become very unhealthy uh, in terms of even efficiency, uh, and, uh, in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, but also it's unhealthy in terms of uh, its uh, impact on environment. But once it is converted into nitrate, you see all these problems associated with the nitrate in addition to inefficiency. So there are two ways we can keep the nitrogen in ammonium form in, a, in our farmlands. One is you can use a chemical nitrification inhibitors, or you can use a biological nitrification inhibition. This is what we have, our group has been working from the last 20 years. And uh, this is the concept. The, the root systems of certain crops have the ability to produce uh, certain kind of antibiotics from the root systems to control um, the nitrifying bacteria. So the, the advantage of using uh, the, the biological system is the antibiotics produced from these root systems, they act as a bacteriostatic, they, they have a bacteriostatic effect, not the bactericidal effect, which means they don't kill the nitrifying bacteria, but they make them dysfunctional. It's a kind of a coma state. The bacteria cannot function, but they are still alive. That is the kind of state they keep. Maybe this is a good strategy. That is how the, na that, uh, the nature has evolved because this is how they keep the different uh, uh, the populations uh, in, in, in balance and under check. 
and they don't kill them completely. They just keep them uh, some kind of uh, inert condition. And uh, once it does not, uh, the, 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 these, uh, these um, antibiotic compounds block the uh, nitrifying, uh, um, nitrifying act bacteria activity, the, the, the movement into the nitrate becomes reduced and the, the moment uh, the, 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 the nitrogen would remain in ammonium form moves into other microbial form, nitrogen forms. So in that way, you, 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 you restrict the moment of nitrogen into these, these uh, pathways of nitrogen loss. That is one of the reasons by by uh, through the PNA function, you can stop the nit uh, nitrifying activity, and uh, you can reduce the nitrogen losses. That is, that includes uh, nitrate leaching, that includes uh, um, the denitrification, the nitrous oxide emissions. All those things can be controlled if we if the plant root systems have the sufficient capability to block this uh, process, and. Uh, uh, this is the brachiara field. Um, this is mostly grown in uh, uh, South America. And uh, I, um, how we have come up to this uh, concept of biological nitrification, I must give you the background of this, uh, this uh, BNA research. Uh, somewhere in the 1980s, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Minami, had visited uh, South America. Uh, for a field visit, and that is when he was brought uh, to the. Uh, he, he, it was brought to his attention that uh, this particular pasture grass somehow does not allow any nitrate to be formed. We don't. They did. They couldn't find any nitrate in the soil, and uh, then it became it became a mystery for us. And we were asked to find out why this grass cannot. Uh, does not allow any nitrate to, 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 to be formed. And also it, it requires very little nitrogen and it doesn't allow any nitrogen to be leaked out either in the form of nitrate or in the form of N2. A very little nitrous oxide comes out from these pastures unlike other pastures, which so this, this pasture has a special ability. And later on, it took several years for us to find out that uh, this grass produces uh, a certain kind of antibiotics from the root systems in large amounts. That is what is blocking the nitrifying bacterial activity. And that is the reason there is no nitrate is formed in this uh, grasses. So the, the, the question is, and of course, we have developed a lot of uh, technological tools uh, during this uh, period. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, an assay system that can detect and quantify the amount of uh, inhibitors they produce from the root systems. So this is, this, this is a kind of centerpiece for the BNA, the entire BNA research what we have developed subsequently. And, uh, and also the, uh, we, uh, it helps in, term, in terms of characterizing the, the inhibitory activity coming from the plant root systems and which, which, which plants have this ability, which plants don't have this ability. What, under what conditions this is released, what kind of chemical compounds are involved uh, in, in getting this function. And also what we have discovered uh, from the last uh, 10, 15 years is um, the plant root system, the, 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 the plant root systems that have this ability to produce these uh, nitrification inhibitors, or you can call them the kind of antibiotics that they, they don't, they, 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 they release only when they sense ammonia in the, in the soil. And, uh, and also the release is confined to the only those regions where um, the, the, the ammonia is located. And so in that way, though the plant root systems have a lot of these compounds, they don't release half a, indiscriminately. They only release when they sense ammonia when they sense ammonia, that is where mostly the uh, the, the nitrifying bacteria is colonized. So they are, the, the root system basically sends and release these uh, antibiotics where there is a nitrifying bacteria is active. That is related, related to the presence of ammonia. So in that way, the delivery of these nitrification inhibitors, if you use to the plant root systems, is more effective than if you use a, a industrially produced nitrification inhibitors because nitrification because it's so difficult to administer them 
at a feed level, these nitrification inhibitors, but whereas it is much easier to administer them through the plant root system if the plants have the ability to produce uh, this, this kind of uh, inhibitors. And uh, we, we have isolated a number of uh, these inhibitors uh, uh, from various uh, from plant, root, plant systems, uh, starting from Brachiara, that the tropical pasture grass that has the strongest ability to produce these uh, uh, inhibitors. And also uh, we um, isolated uh, certain uh, inhibitors from sorghum, from rice. Um, this is from the Brachiara. Uh, and another point is uh, these, the, these inhibitors coming from the plant systems, they have a multi-mode of inhibit reaction. Unlike the, the, the synthetic nitrification inhibitors, which are mostly uh, have a single mode of action. And uh, another, uh, one more advantage of these uh, the biologically produced systems is the, 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 the plants produce a cocktail of inhibitors uh, with the different modes of action, different chemical structures, and the different, um, uh, um, 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 so it, it's much more difficult uh, for the nitrifying bacteria to develop resistance uh, to this kind of uh, uh, cocktail of inhibitors. Whereas the synthetic nitrification inhibitors, since the mode of, mode of action is very, very uh, specific, it's much easier to, to overcome the, the inhibitor effect and develop resistance uh, with the time. And also another point we wanted to say is, uh, uh, as I said, the current uh, uh, production systems have moved almost completely towards nitrate-based nitrogen nutrition. But the, all we need is if we can uh, develop this kind of ability in our crop plants, even a moderate shift, even 20 to 30 percent inhibition could lead to uh, improving uh, 20 to 30 percent. Uh, 20 to 30 percent inhibition leads to the availability, uh, availability of 20 to 30 percent ammonium form of nitrogen. And uh, the, if, if you can provide ammonium and the nitrate together, uh, in the plant or in the, in the in the root zone, that would have a synergistic effect. You see a big effect on growth and productivity, at least in certain genetic stocks. Uh, this is what we have seen in sorghum, where uh, you can see just a 20% inhibition leads to a 20% improvement in ammonium levels, and the remaining 80% is still nitrate. You can have almost 50 to 60% increase in growth of uh, sorghum. We have seen the same thing in wheat also. This is what we have written up, me and Tim have written up uh, recently in one of our opinion pieces. Uh, so by improving the, um, the BNA capacity, which BNA capacity means the, the inhibitor production, or you can say uh, the antibiotics production specific to uh, the nitrifying bacteria. So by improving the BNA capacity of the plant root systems, so you can not only reduce the nitrogen losses, but also you can stimulate crop growth. In a way, you can also improve the, uh, the yield potential of the crops. This is another reason, and another way to, uh, to improve the yield potential and probably it's a, a, a path to um, further improvement of the yield potential in order to reach the uh, the 70 to 80 percent uh, increase in, uh, in in food grain production uh, by 2050. So the BNA function, uh, improving the BNA capacity, uh, can have a multifaceted role in terms of reducing the uh, uh, nitrogen pollution, but also improving the the productive potential of crops. So if we can introduce this kind of trade successfully, and uh, we have. Uh, we have been working on uh, uh, introducing this kind of trait into wheat. The cultivated wheat doesn't have sufficient capability in terms of producing these uh, uh, nitrification inhibitors or antibiotic compounds to control the nitrifying bacteria. So we found after several, several years of search that this is a wild wheat uh, called Lemus racemosus. It has almost 20 to 30 fold higher uh, 
uh, nitrification inhibitor production in the root systems compared to the cultivated wheat. Uh, and uh, it took quite a bit of our effort and time to uh, identify the chromosome segment that is in this wild wheat that is responsible for producing these uh, uh, nitrification inhibitors. And uh, we have now successfully transferred the uh, a chromosome segment uh, that is LRN, SA, short arm, uh, into uh, the cultivated wheat. This is a monal, this is a uh, elite wheat line that has nearly 10 to 12, uh, 10 to 12 uh, um, tons grain yield uh, potential. Um, so this is the, the inhibitory activity coming from the roots of the 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 the, the monal the, the the cultivated wheat without the bna function and this is where we have introduced the bna function almost the the the, the inhibitor production from the root systems have increased almost two to five fold uh, in this uh, the the bna wheat uh, this is the elite wheat where we have introduced a, a segment of the wild wheat chromosome controlling the BNI's production. This is how uh, the, they behave in the field. This is the control, the, monal, the, the normal wheat variety, whatever we are growing currently. And this is how the, the, the karyogram, the chromosomes look in this. And this is where we have introduced this, this, this segment. You can see that this is the LRNSA. This is coming from the, the wild wheat and uh, controlling the BNI production. And because of that, this since it produces almost three to five fold higher uh, inhibitor production, it can keep the nitrogen uh, in the soil, whereas it cannot keep the nitrogen in the soil. It washes out, and um, and it is and and then the the crop is uh, showing the nitrogen deficiency when it comes to heading. But whereas here we don't see any nitrogen deficiency because there is no loss of nitrogen from these fields because the, it is controlling the nitrate activity and it is keeping the nitrate formation much lower than here. That is the reason this, this, this nitrogen is still available for the crop. They both are fertilized exactly in the same way. And uh, because of the... Uh, the uh, the possibility of synergistic effect coming from the availability of ammonium. You can see the, the BNA monal um, showed such, uh, higher grain yields at different nitrogen inputs, starting from anywhere between at lower end, you can see up to 50% higher, uh, higher yields and compared to about uh, uh, around 16 to about 10 to 16 percent higher yields at the higher at the, as you increase the nitrogen fertilizer applications. So generally, it doesn't require that much nitrogen. Maybe around 30 to 40 percent lower nitrogen is a, uh, with, is, a, is more than adequate to, to give as much yields as uh, the the normal the normal wheat. But uh, it, it 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 only needs around 30 to 40 percent lower. Uh, means roughly around 60% of what we are giving is, is more than adequate to get 100% yields of what the current um, the high yielding varieties are providing. And this is the nitrogen recovery of the BNI wheat at different nitrogen inputs compared to this is the control wheat. This is a before introduction of the BNA trait after introduction of the BNA trait, the nitrogen uptake is much higher in the BNA weeds. And this is what uh, we have published recently in the PNS. And uh, um, uh, efforts are now underway to introduce this, uh, uh, the BNA trait coming from the wild wheat into several elite wheat varieties adapted to various uh, various grow, wheat growing regions of the world and starting from US, Europe uh, and uh, uh, India uh, is, uh, is our now we are, uh, with, with, with different groups we are working uh, in these three different regions uh, to transfer um, the, this BNA trade into uh, the elite varieties of these regions. And also we are working on uh, sorghum 
to improve the BNA capacity of sorghum. And here, the, the, compo the BNA compound is different. This is the a sorghum. This is what it is producing from the root systems. Now we are trying to improve the sorghum production from the root systems as a way to improve the BNA capacity of sorghum. And also recently we started working on maize where the, the inhibitor is, is a geonone, uh, which is the major, one of the major components of the um, nitrification inhibitors coming from the maize. And the brachiara, this tropical pasture grass, which we start, this is our initial work. The main compound coming from the brachiara is brachialactone. And this is our uh, earlier work where we have showed that uh, in brachiara pastures, on a per day, it can release up to 2.6 to 7.5 million units of inhibitory activity can be released on a daily basis from a brachiara pasture under ideal conditions. And if you convert that into a synthetic nitrification inhibitor, about six to 18 kilograms of nitrogen, nitropyrin application per hectare per year, that is the amount of inhibitory effect the roots are generating in this pasture. And uh, if you increase the, if you, this, this is the N2 emissions from the field, um, and uh, this is the, the BNA capacity of the root systems from the low capacity to high capacity. You can see the nitrous oxide emissions are, are coming down as you increase the BNA capacity of the root systems. This is what we wanted to do. We wanted to improve the BNA capacity of root systems of staple food crops so that the n emissions and the nitrate formation can be substantially controlled. And what we have showed uh, during this presentation is uh, the, the, the development of BNI wheat is a case study. And also you could uh, exploit the BNI function, uh, let's say from using the pasture uh, that has a very high levels of BNA capacity of the root systems. You can integrate with uh, a relatively lower BNA capacity, a crop like maize. You can, you can integrate the BNA pastures and the maize crop in such a way that uh, the maize crop can be benefited from the, the inhibitor production coming from the brachiarosis pasture. So in this case, you can see the maize crop was introduced after uh, brachiara pasture, and uh, here this is a, a continuous maize cultivation. You can see the, the difference uh, because of the controlling of the nitrification. So you can exploit the BNA function from a systems perspective. So what uh, uh, some of my uh, uh, final thoughts in this, uh, 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 in this uh, topic is um, uh, after five decades of uh, uh, green revolution and the, the nitrogen applications have grown uh, to a certain point, uh, to a certain stage now that we are reaching the, the point of diminishing returns. We are applying more and more nitrogen fertilizer and more and more nitrogen fertilizer is leaching out. And what I have showed earlier, the nitrogen pollution, what you see in the lakes, the nitrogen pollution, what you see in the groundwater is an indication that nitrogen is leaking uncontrollably from our agricultural systems. So now a course correction is needed after five decades of green revolution, because now we must stop. We must stop this current practice of nitrogen management. And we probably need to develop a new ideas in terms of, and also new traits in plants in order to control this nitrification process, in order to control the nitrogen, the, the nitrate formation in such a massive way, uh, if, if, uh, if by controlling the nitrifier activity. So the BNA trait, the BNA technology is probably one of the several new technologies needed um, in order to, uh, control the nitrogen pollution problems, and the nitrogen pollution problems also leads to loss of nitrogen, loss of fertility of our soils, um, and the loss of organic matter levels in our soils. So all these things are interlinked. If we can control the nitrification process, control the nitrifying bacteria, 
uh, the, the nitrogen losses can be controlled and the, the soil fertility can be built up. In stuff. Now we are, the more nitrogen fertilizer we are applying, we are losing more natural soil fertility. This needs to be reversed. If we have to prepare our system for next green revolution, we need to address some of these things. And also we need, um, in, in, in my earlier slides, I showed that the loss of, the economic loss from 70% uh, of nitrogen fertilizer is uh, estimated at nine, $90 billion, whereas the social cost of 14 gigatons of GHG emissions coming from agriculture, the economic cost is, at, uh, is estimated at $700 billion so per year. So the, the environmental cost is much, much higher than the economic cost of the fertilizer loss. Plus, if you add the the, the human health factor, the, the, the kind of health problems the nitrate pollution is causing, that would be much, much higher in terms of the, the, the dollar value. In addition, um, the, the currently, uh, the, by 2050, uh, um, the, 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 green, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, the need to be reduced to about 80% of the uh, current levels. And the agriculture is coming to contributing nearly 30% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And most of these greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, uh, to, uh, uh, coming from uh, a nitrogen fertilizer production and its utilization in agriculture. So if you, if you want to reduce the GHG emissions from agriculture, you have to reduce the nitrogen fertilizer applications substantially. We have to reduce the nitrogen leakage from the system. So the BNA technology is a part of uh, green technologies that are now uh, uh, as part of the main policy uh, a policy decision of the Japanese government uh, committed to develop uh, uh, as part of the green technologies. And uh, we believe that uh, it doesn't really need to have a big premium in terms of cost because by introducing the BNA capacity, BNA ability into our staple food crops, we are not reducing the yield potential as we have seen. The BNA weeds, what we have shown here, actually have better yield potential than the conventional weeds. So there is no cost involved by introducing this kind of ability into our staple crops. And also since this is seed-based technology, it doesn't need to be, there is no additional cost involved. Unlike, uh, 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 unlike using the synthetic nitrification inhibitors where there is additional cost and also application cost involved. But for the BNA technology, there is no additional cost. And also, we probably have to be working at the crop cultivars that respond positively to soil ammonia. So, which means when 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 you introduce the BNA capacity, it would improve the ammonium levels and also reduce the nitrate levels. So, there are certain uh, genetic stocks that uh, that that are benefited from the increasing availability of ammonium. So that would open up the breeding opportunities. So another point is also we, we can possibly integrate the SNIS, synthetic nitrification inhibitors with the BNI enabled production system. So this is still in the testing phase. And we, 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 we think that there is a possibility of a synergistic effect from the BNIS and the SNIS integration that we will have to see that we, we are planning to test that concept. And also the current SNIS, the synthetic nitrification inhibitors are not very effective. So we need to develop more effective SNIS in future, which can be used more, in, uh, more for the integration purpose. A couple of uh, policy issues I wanted to bring up here. The cost of nitrogen fertilizers should reflect the energy cost of nitrogen, the true energy cost of nitrogen fertilizers, which means we need to eliminate some of the subsidies given to nitrogen fertilizers if you wanted to uh, develop the new technologies that can improve the a nitrogen efficiency, whether it is SNIs or whether to develop uh, the BNA technology further. And also we may have to think about introducing a nitrate, nitrate cess 
uh, the next generation of SNS development. And uh, uh, what we have showed with the BNIV development is a beginning, but it can be developed, it can be introduced into other uh, staple crops. Um, and also need to incentivize adoption of uh, BNIs, uh, integration and farming practices like how about BNA enabled cover crops and also introducing the concept of nitrogen credits uh, akin to carbon credits. So the, that's um, that's all uh, I have. Um, so we strongly believe that the next green revolution need to be a clean green revolution. Next need to be a clean green revolution. In addition to um, I, you know, the, in addition to being more productive, it has to be ecologically friendly, and uh, we believe that soil nitrification control is key to solve nitrogen problems, and the BNA technology is going to play an important role in that effort. Thank you, Tim. Here, let me unmute myself. Thank you very much. Um, we now have some time for questions. I think uh, people are going to be able to raise their hands and we'll be able to see them. You could also uh, provide your questions in the question and answer session. While people are kind of getting their questions, I, I just wanted to ask you two questions, uh, Gunter. One is, uh, how long do you think it's going to take to get wheat, this wheat uh, variety into, or the BNI into true commercially available weeds? When, when can farmers actually be expected to be able to use them. And the second, maybe you could comment a little bit on the challenges you've had, the success, but also the challenges you've had in getting attention and funding for this, for this area. I mean, you did a lot of this with kind of volunteer labor from a few breeders and little budget. Maybe you could talk about both of those subjects. Yeah, uh, about the time frame. Uh, I think uh, the, the BNA trait is already introduced into the elite wheat backgrounds. So, like what we showed, uh, the Munal, and there are three or four elite wheat backgrounds we have already introduced to the BNA trait, that is LR and SCA translocation, and successfully it is expressed. Um, so uh, the proof of concept is established. Uh, probably it will take about uh, at least a minimum five years of large scale field trials uh, are needed before the variety can be certified, before the, uh, it has to be released in different countries. Each country must test it, you know that. Uh, so I think at least five to 10 years, you will see the first generation of BNA weeds will be available for the farmers. Uh, initially, I think uh, uh, India, uh, probably uh, uh, India, Mexico, um, and maybe I think uh, we, are, we have started working with the U.S. groups, UC Cali uh, University of California, Davis Group, and the Texas A&M. These are two groups are working with us. And you will see next five to 10 years, some of the BNA wheat varieties available in the US. And uh, since we have already started large scale evaluation of BNA wheats in India, you will see India, US, and uh, we are also started working with the BAS of people uh, to develop BNA wheats for the European region. So all these things are in the pipeline. So maybe I would imagine in the next five to 10 years, you will see at least in some of these places, uh, you will have the BNA weeds uh, in the, uh, available for the farmers. Great, and tell us a little bit about the funding. And also maybe, I think if you could stop sharing your screen, then we can see you as you're answering and yeah. maybe yeah. other participants. Okay. Um, and tell us a little bit about how you can manage you to you know, build support for this and, and the funding challenges. Uh, at the moment, we we don't have we have enough we have some funding from the MAF uh, to work on uh, wheat uh, to develop the our work on wheat, 
a little bit work on maize and uh, some rapiara work and a little bit work on sorghum. Uh, we got some funding recently from the MAF to, to test this BNA technology for the, for the uh, endogangetic planes. Uh, that's, that's the reason from this April, we will be taking up a large scale field evaluations of some of the BNA elite weeds what we have developed and also introduce the LRNA, LRNSA translocation into the other uh, elite weeds that are adapted to Indian conditions. So this funding was given to the CIMIT BISA, uh, Borlaug Institute of Southeast Asia Studies, uh, um, and uh, JCAS, uh, and a couple of other Japanese institutions and ICR institutions are going to work with us. Uh, to do this large-scale uh, field evaluation of the BNA lines and also introduce the BNA trait into the other uh, elite weeds adapted to the Indian conditions. So this is what is ongoing right now. Uh, we don't have that much funding and our CIMIT colleagues uh, are in a serious financial crisis. Mm. And uh, even the, the laboratory that is involved in uh, making these white crosses, now it is closed now from this April. Uh, so we have many problems recently with the funding, particularly for collaborators, uh, the CIMIT collaborators. So we have serious problems in terms of funding. Okay. So I, I don't know if we can see hands. I, I don't have any way to see hands, Keely. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, by the question and answer session. We have seven more minutes or so. Uh, is there a way I can see hands if there's sign or to show people? Because if not, um, I see a question coming from Victor Comarel. Victor. Yeah, it's a question. Yeah. Yeah. So the ninety. Just... Yeah, the ninety billion loss due to fertilizer production calculated. Yeah. So, so that is based on. Uh, uh, the the cost the uh, the amount of nit nitrogen fertilizer that is currently applied to wheat production systems. Now this is for the entire for the, all the 150 billion 150 million metric tons. I think the the cost was estimated around I think 250 dollars per ton of nitrogen fertilizer. That was the basis uh, used uh, used and also 70 percent loss. And uh, the uh, the two fifty dollars per ton of I think that was the calculation that was the, um, the numbers used for cal coming up to this ninety billion loss. But actually, when we made that calculation, it was two fifty dollars per ton. But it is already now it is more than a thousand dollars per ton of nitrogen fertilizer. So it has increased substantially in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So actually, the the the, the the nitrogen law, uh, economic loss is going to be much higher now with the present day nitrogen fertilizer cost compared to when it was calculated. And me, what about this question? The relationship between soil organic carbon and BNI. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, I think uh, um, if, if we have a higher BNI function from the root system, so it will improve the soil organic carbon. In theory, but you know uh, uh, that to, for, to to observe changes in soil organic matter levels takes years of effort uh, monitoring. So it is not that quickly you can see the change in. But it, in theory, it should it should because when the nitrogen leaves, carbon leaves from the soil. So if you keep the nitrogen, carbon stays in the soil. Very simple. Yeah. And what about, what about the uh, progress on some of the other crops? Uh, so you've got progress on wheat. You've talked about the sorghum. Where are things for, uh, let's say, maize? Uh, 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 maize, uh, yeah, maize, I think that we have uh, made some good progress recently in terms of isolating the BNA compounds. Now we have a pretty good understanding about the chemical basis of the BNA uh, BNA compounds in maize, but uh, a lot needs to be done. Um, it's only started a year ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we have made some progress, but uh, 
you're talking about it, it will take at least next to five to ten years to have a good understanding and also to prepare the framework of, to prepare the kind of uh, uh, the, the breeding framework for the maize uh, in order to reach where we are in terms of uh, uh, I mean that the wheat work what you see is uh, almost the last 15 years of effort to reach where we are so for maize to reach where we are uh, to where for, for, for wheat, uh, it will take at least a minimum 10 years for maize to, uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 to be able to uh, demonstrate something in the field. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Uh, and um, there was a last question about the relationship between nitrate and nitrifying bacteria in acid soils. Uh, relation between nitrate and nitrifying bacteria. Yeah, of course. I mean, even in acid soils, nitrification happens, but it happens at a slower rate. But the relationship between nitrate and nitrifying bacteria is the same like in normal soils. If you have nit more nitrifying bacteria active, you have more nitrate is formed, mm -hmm. even in acid soils. So it is it's exactly the same way. Great. Well, I think, thank you so much. And it's, it's uh, 2 15 in the morning there. And thank you uh, extraordinarily for staying up late, giving us a great presentation. I am so excited about this work. Uh, you know, it's funny because you've talked about the, the impact on nitrogen, but if there could be a 10 or 15 or 20% impact on yield, that is just as dramatic in terms of, and even for the environment, in terms of the potential land savings. So I think that uh, it's super exciting uh, work and uh, we'll look forward to your TED talk and thank you very much for speaking with us. And I guess by, we'll, we'll call it, bring this to an end, but uh, everyone will be cut off suddenly, but thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Tim. It's my pleasure. And good night to everyone or good day to everyone. <laughs> good morning. <laughs>